Like everything else, business has a language all its own, and I plan to help you speak it. I'm Greg Stoller from the Carroll School of Management MBA program at Boston College. A budding entrepreneur gets an idea. Next comes the business plan. Some business plans wind up sitting on bookshelves collecting dust, while others are immediately put to work. On this show, we'll tell you how all kinds of companies, large and small, are planned, implemented, and run. For over a decade, I've been approached by scores of entrepreneurs who would like business plans developed for their new ventures. Each year, I narrow that list down to the most viable 20 and regularly enlist a team of over 50 mentors and advisors to help my classes in writing them. Hearing from these entrepreneurs directly, you can learn from both their successes and their failures. Some entrepreneurs spend a great amount of time developing their plan, while others go for the back of a napkin approach. Which one is best? Today, we will be exploring the pros and cons of both. Our first guest tells us how. I'd like to welcome Tony Solomons into the studio. Tony, welcome. Hi, Greg. So Tony, tell me about your current business and what you do for a living. Ideal Marketing Group is a direct import consulting firm. Uh, we provide international trade assistance to American companies seeking to do business overseas. This is the third iteration of what began as a family business. The first one was a manufacturer's representative firm based in Chestnut Hill. The second one was a startup based in London. And this one is entirely my own, also a startup. And you mentioned that you have a lot of international uh, interest. Where are some of the geographies that you do business in? We do a lot of business in China, but also Hong Kong. We do business in Taiwan, uh, Japan, Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines. And what sort of element of the process do you get involved with? Obviously, you're not manufacturing the products, but you said you were assisting and advising your clients. We serve as our clients' uh, outsourced import department, if you will. So for our clients, importing products from third-party distributors. We help them shorten the supply chain by showing them how to import directly themselves, and we provide the facility within our offices in Boston and in Hong Kong to do all the documentation, all the shipment tracking, all the order flow management, merchandising, packaging. It's really a, a turnkey, end-to-end -end, uh, process. And what would you say is the biggest business challenge that you're facing right now? Right now, as always, the biggest challenge is finding the right people. Uh, we, you know, we, we are a small business. We've got a limited number of, of personnel, uh, and there are no passengers. Uh, everyone provides a vital and important service, uh, and often those are very specific functions. Um, and uh, you know, we believe in hiring smart, talented people who have a strong work ethic, uh, who are able to work independently and think creatively, and, uh, and we believe in incentivizing them properly and creating a plan. Uh, and with specific objectives and specific uh, measurement benchmarks, uh, and then giving them the tools and resources they need and getting out of the way and letting them do their work. So use the word plan. Uh, the focus of this segment is on to what extent companies are using traditional business plans. We've both, I'm sure, run into in our respective careers your 50-page, neatly laser-printed business plan. Many people are moving away from those. My guess is that you don't use one, so how do you plan for your current business? First of all, I think the most valuable thing about a business plan is the thought and the foresight and the introspection that goes into it. Sure. Uh, and I think the, the, the actual document itself uh, is valuable as a touchstone to make sure while you're in the fray that you're generally moving in the right direction. Um, but uh, for us, uh, constructing a 50 or 60 page business plan wasn't uh, the option that we pursued for a couple of reasons. Number one, I think once those plans are written, by the time the ink is dry, things have changed, circumstances have changed, and, and it's less and less relevant. The other problem is that uh, I have this problem with white papers in general, and that is that they, they get put on a shelf and they don't get read. So, so in lieu of a formal business plan, do you have monthly reviews? You mentioned you had offices locally, also in Hong Kong. Do you have weekly conference calls? Do you have regular planning reviews, either every month, every quarter? Help us understand that process. We have a formal weekly meeting uh, in our office here. Uh, where we review um, not only basic operational things and, and uh, how, how situations were handled, how outstanding matters are to be handled, but on a broader sense we share information relating to the marketplace, relating to competition, uh, relating to regulatory changes that affect our business, uh, and, and we continually refine our plans and objectives based on these new inputs. Do you come up with specific metrics for the people you're hiring or do you do it at the company level? 
Uh, we do both. At the company level, um, we, we set specific uh, performance targets for, uh, usually it's done by product line or product segment. Uh, and at the individual level, the performance targets um, are, are set in conjunction with each employee based on, the, based on the objectives for that particular function. And how do you deal with products or employees who haven't met that target at the end of each reporting period? With both of those examples, you look at the reasons why it didn't happen the way, uh, the way you expected to. And, and you know, in, in business, if there's one thing that's guaranteed is that things aren't going to turn course, out exactly right, the way right. that you thought they would, both on the plus and the minus side. Uh, and so uh, we, we, we take those, uh, those inputs as well, uh, which, which occurred after the original plan was put in sure. place. Uh, and we decide if going forward uh, it's something that's within our control, it's not within our control. Uh, and certainly if it's without our control, then there's no you know, repercussions, obviously. Of course. But, but uh, if it's something that's within our control, we take steps to fix it. So you mentioned that you do a lot of work uh, in the Far East, uh, in those geographies. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming one of those countries is going to be China. Yep. China China has gone through a massive positive reform over the past 20 years. In Chinese, it's called Gaigo Kaifeng, which is reform and open market uh, approaches or open market opening. Help me understand, in lieu of a formal business plan, how a lot of your planning processes work in China. Basically, they work the same way they work here. Uh, and and on one hand, on the one hand, you could make a very powerful case for using formal business plans in China. Um, and the, one of the main reasons for that is that culturally, Chinese people are very literal people. And uh, having a formalized document to, to refer to is very, very useful in, in, in ensuring that things go along according to plan. I think for us, again, because of the size of our organization, because, of, because the people within our organization are highly experienced at what they do, um, it works better for us to do this verbally and on a personal level. Our plan, as, as it were, is a living, breathing document, and it's constantly being modified and improved by the new inputs of information. But how do you then sort of process the effects of exogenous factors in the sense that all of a sudden the laws have changed? For example, in the Guangzhou region, which is the southern part of China, uh, right above Hong Kong, north of Hong Kong, uh, minimum wages have increased by 20% uh, out of nowhere. You have the government that is going to be favoring certain sectors for investment versus not uh, other sectors for investment. How do you, either in lieu of a formal business plan or even informal business plan, factor those changes into running a, a living, breathing business? Those are the inputs, precisely the types of inputs that I'm talking about. So if uh, for example, minimum wage results uh, increases result in an increase in labor costs, which results in an increase in FOB costs of product. You're going to have to take a hard look at your sales forecast. And for the benefit for of our products. viewers, FOB stands for free, free on board, the, 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 the price at the port. Okay. Uh, and so uh, if something's going to impact the cost of your product, then it obviously is going to have some, some knock-on effect to the overall sales of that product and obviously the profitability of that product. So you have to work that back into your estimates of, 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 of your, your sales plan. Sure. And possibly your marketing plan too. Many of our viewers might be considering their own businesses, uh, either domestically here in the United States or internationally. What one or two pieces of advice would you have for them, not only in terms of business planning, but also the use or lack thereof of a formal written business plan? Uh, well, I, I would say that if, if uh, an entrepreneur is considering starting out in a business, particularly if it's a business that is new to him or her, I would absolutely recommend going through the formal writing of a business plan. Even something 50 pages long? Even something 50 pages long, even if they never look at it again. Because during that process, you're going to be forced to focus on the issues that meaningfully impact your business and its ultimate viability. Uh, also, for an entrepreneur just starting out at a new business, if you need to seek financing, banks are going to want to see a business plan, venture capitalists are going to want to see a business plan without, without a doubt. Uh, and finally, uh, I, I alluded to the viability of your business. That goes all the way down to the product level. You should be having a business plan for each product or product line and a, a thorough understanding of what that market is and, and the ultimate viability of that product. And even for a brand new and nascent company in a, a rapidly changing geography like China, you'd still recommend some sort of written document? The newer the entrepreneur is to the, is to the business and the concept and the market, the more important it becomes. Even if, as I said, you don't refer to it uh, on a daily basis. Because because you need to ask yourself those questions in order to answer the first question, which is, should I be in this business? Is this a viable business for me to be in? Thank you, Tony. Tony Solomon just talked about an informal business plan. What about something of the fuller length variety, perhaps 50 pages long? Our next guest is going to talk about that. I'm Greg Stoller, and you're watching The Language of Business.
Bethany Ann Doak. Ian Donnelly. Kirsty Lynn Duthit. We'll now speak with Jeff Holton, who's been involved with several startups during his career. In nearly every case, he uses detailed written business plans. Jeff, welcome to the Language of Business. Greg, thanks a lot for having me. This is an exciting new concept and a great new show. Well, thank you again for joining us. So tell us, what startups are you currently involved with? Well, Greg, the one I'm working on right now is a particularly interesting one for me because, personally, it's very different than things I've done in the past, traditional enterprise software, consumer electronics. This one's about my passion, about my passion for the outdoors and photography and all the exciting changes that have happened in digital photography, digital editing, digital printmaking, trying to create a fine art print that really harkens much more back to the traditional watercolor sporting artists. So tell us about the details for the benefit of our viewers. Well, what I'm trying to do is I came back from Montana and several trips with a lot of photography that I looked at and said, this is pretty, pretty interesting, but it's not different. And if I wanted to make it commercial, I had to become a different identity, a different brand. And I started looking around my walls and noticing all of these artists that I collected. And these were the traditional artists working in watercolor. I suddenly thought, if I could use this new digital technology to fuse what they were doing and the look and the feel with what I was doing, that could be pretty interesting. And that's what I'm trying. So let's talk about the planning for a second. Uh, at the very beginning of the startup phase, six to eight months before you go live, tell us piece by piece how the planning actually works. Well, I've always found written plans to be incredibly important, especially when you're working in a team environment, because the, the art of business, as my friend Guy Kawasaki's new book talks about the art of the start, it's really about the nexus of what we think we know and what we don't know. So a written plan is a document, a vehicle for the team, especially today's market where everybody's dispersed, they're geographically in different places, working remotely from different cultures, a written document and testimony to what we think we know and some metrics and some tools to decide what are we getting from feedback from our customers and how do we integrate that to keep a strategic vision. But it sounds like you're referring to this in almost a hard copy form, but my guess is the process is far more dynamic than that. Right? Absolutely. We talk a lot about this in the MBA program at Boston College, that it's not just about going about and finding the facts. It's about a discussion, a relationship, and finding out what the marketplace really is looking for and adapting to that. You hear a lot of talk today about why business plans aren't important because venture capitalists don't read sure. them. And the reality is that they're now reading those plans, the detail of those plans, from the minds of the, of the, of the uh, team. They're looking at those people and saying, do these guys really understand the problem? And are they smart enough and experienced enough to develop an alternative when it changes? Because everybody that's done a startup knows that where you begin in the plan is not where you're going to end up. And the plan has to incorporate that. So right now, in the context of your latest startup, where are you in the planning phase? And to what extent have you already used written business plans or are transitioning to version number two or version number three? I started out with a plan. Um, written as well as in my mind about what I thought the customer wanted, what the marketplace was, what the price point was. And what I found out is started measuring what shows I thought I needed to be at, what the expenses were going to be to go to these shows to, to create the artwork, was this is art, it's not science, so it's very different. I'm trying to understand now on paper what business opportunity really exists there? How big is that opportunity? How big is the market? And what are the dynamics of addressing that marketplace? Uh, I obviously can't be everywhere at every time. I can't travel independently anywhere I want to. I can't expect people necessarily to underwrite those trips too. So I really need to understand that and how to scale this as well. What are the different distribution channels? That's my project for this winter, is to understand what are the different distribution venues for this art that I'm trying to create? Is it just through the resorts that I may travel to? Or is it in galleries? What yep. are the economics of the gallery? How do I understand that? And how do I sell directly? And what are the economics of that? So let's move on to technology. You've talked a lot about your own research. You've talked a lot about the customer. How does changes, adaptations, alterations in your own technology or the moves of your competitors affect your next strategic move? Well, I think that what's really important, I think, that, and the reason to have a business plan and why I'm so uh, bullish on that is to have a, a, a baseline plan that you can understand what the economics are, what the dynamics are of the business. Because you're, when you get those changes from customers wanting art about themselves, that implies very different economics than going in thinking that you were just going to create things that people would either like or not like, perhaps in a gallery setting. 
in traditional technology business, it's incredibly important because, again, your team is traveling, your team is changing, and if you don't incorporate that in some formal way back into the business plan through status reports and meetings, you don't have a strategic vision of where you're trying to go. And you really have to pay attention to the customer because they are the ultimate arbitrator. I'm Greg Stoller, and in the studio we have Jeff Holton, who is a serial entrepreneur, who is discussing the need for written business plans. So going back to my question, how do you communicate with your stakeholders and who, in many cases, cases are your stakeholders? Are they employees, either full-time equivalents or part-time people who are technology experts? Are you regularly communicating with your customers about the development of the business? Or really is this the case that it's a one-person show and ultimately if the technology works, the customer is going to be happy? Well, that's a good question. Uh, it primarily is a one-person show, although I'm use, starting to use outside vendors for some additional printing capabilities, et cetera. And I think that it's um, important to try to figure out how you're going to integrate outside players into your business plan. Um, the real question I have is how scalable is this idea? Because at the end of the day, it is art. It's not a technology product that you're bringing to market and you have great scale with. So I'm trying to understand the dynamics of that and where I can take this particular product. What do you think the value proposition is? Ultimately, is it it's cool, it's unique, it's a different type of art, or do you really think that you have something that has a differentiable competitive advantage? I think the competitive advantage and the differentiating factor here, the value proposition to the consumer, is this is something that tends to be about me or my relationship to what I've been doing in the field. It's, un it's captured in the field digitally, but it's presented to me in a traditional printed format. You being the entrepreneur or you being the customer? The customer. What I thought going in was it's art and people will either appreciate it or not and they'll pay some fair value for that piece of art. What I found out from traveling to different places, different venues, and, and working with people in the field was people much more value the ability to do something about them and about their family, about their hunting dog or about their fly fishing expedition with their friends. That had great value, but that couldn't easily be done in the old technology of painting. So bringing digital technology to bear on that was really the opportunity to understand there's a new market, a new price point, a new way that I can leverage it. Sure. Focusing on the business plan, the written business plan in particular, given your many startups you've been involved with and all of your years of doing this, what do you consider to be the most important portion of the business plan? That's another great question. We talk about this at, at, in the BC uh, MBA program as well because the business plan has to be dynamic and organic. And I think to me and my experience from the 11 startups that I've done in traditional technology, the real important two things, and I think there are two things that are really important, is what's the outflow and what's the inflow at the end of the day. Understanding the dynamics of sales and the customer acquisition and can you get sales and is that repeatable, is that scalable, coupled with how are you spending money? Is the marketing budget that you're using effective? Are the tools that you're using effective? Are you spending too much money ahead of the curve or behind the curve? And how to link those two things together? Because every startup worries about running out of money. And that's, those are the two pieces in the plan that will help you prevent doing so. What closing comments do you have, advice, if you will, for a young entrepreneur who is weighing the need for the PowerPoint presentation, the executive summary, or the full-length business plan? My advice from my experience personally is that the most successful startups that I've been personally involved in really have two components. They have a written plan, a strategic plan that everybody buys into and contributes to. And then they have a component where what I used to say is everybody likes to fight. They fight sure. over the ideas, the competitive challenge of I don't believe your sales forecast or I don't believe this or I want to add to this. And at the end of the day you recoalesce around this idea, this written plan that the team is going forward on. Because it's extremely hard in today's technology world where everybody's diverse and working from remote locations to keep everybody literally on the same page. And the business plan is how you do that. Excellent. Jeff Holton has been on the show discussing the need for full length written business plans. But what happens if you're only in the planning stages of a new venture, which hasn't yet launched? Is this still back of the napkin territory, or is it time to begin putting fingers to keyboard and pounding out an extensive written plan? We'll find out from our next guest on the Language of Business. It's not his new group of friends, the video games, or the neighborhood. Mom, do I have to go to school today? The biggest threat to your child's future could be you. Every day they miss puts their graduation at risk. Cindy Brown is in the midst of building her latest company, slated to open this coming June. It will be Boston's first ice bar called Frost, located in Quincy Market. Our first two guests discuss the pros and cons of using written business plans. 
As Cindy is still in the pre-launch planning stage, let's find out from her which approach she's using. Cindy, welcome and thank you for joining us in the Language of Business. Thanks for having me. So what is the Frost Ice Bar? Could you tell us a little bit about the concept? Sure, it's interesting. A lot of people don't know the concept, so it's been an education in explaining what it actually is, but it's a year-round ice bar where you pay an admission fee, you get gloves and a cape, you go through a little transition room where we take down your body temperature and then the doors open and you're in a beautiful ice castle where the walls, the furniture, the bar, and even the glass with your drink is made of ice with great lighting and music and sculptures and etchings. It's really a neat experience. Now, how did you decide that this is going to work in Boston? Because I know from my research, these are literally all over the world. They are. They're mostly in Europe and Canada and not so much in the U.S. yet. But my previous job at Boston Duck Tours led me to a lot of discussion and a lot of inside information on what the market will take, what the market wants, what the market needs. And once we started talking about Frost Ice Bar and knowing what we know from Boston Duck Tours, we thought it was a great product and Boston needed something new and fun and you know the alcohol kind of brings a new market into that you know 20 to 40 year old that is really looking for something to do that's fun. Now you mentioned that Boston Duck was your former uh, job. Is there going to be any connection between Boston Duck and Frost? Yeah actually I shouldn't have said former it's still my job as well. I'll be CEO of both companies. Duck Tours has been around for 19 years so that's really much farther in the process but I'll be doing um, a lot of the startup and Boston Duck Tours is actually an investor in Frost Ice Bar so there's a lot of synergies financially as well as marketing, IT, sales, there's there's going to be a lot of overlap with respect to how the businesses operate. So is it going to be a cross-licensing approach in the sense you're going to give plugs for Boston Duck at the ice bar and then you're going to give plugs for the ice bar during Boston Duck and There tours. might be a sculpture or two of a duck boat <laughs> in, the, in the ice bar and there will certainly be a mention when we go by, but there are a lot of synergies so it makes sense to, to put them together and, and, and take the strengths of each product with the others. Is there going to be anything different about the Frost Ice Bar concept in Boston that there would be all over the world? We believe it's going to be the largest in the world, which is interesting because you don't need a lot of space. Largest in terms of customer counts or largest in terms of square footage or both? Square footage and hopefully customer counts. That will come once we open and we, we prove through, but it's about 1,600 square feet, so it's rather large compared to other ones that are, again, primarily in Canada and Europe. So the focus of this segment is on the business planning process. Obviously, you're in the midst of planning right now. Help us to understand and our viewers to understand how do you communicate with your management team on a regular basis? Is it in person? Is it over the phone? Is it via email or some combination of the three? It's every single thing and probably more. I think we talk in dreams sometimes because we'll wake up the next morning with similar ideas. But right. it's weekly conference calls, it's bi-weekly meetings, and then subcategories of our team will meet on particular objects. So if someone's talking about finance, I'm not in that. The finance team will sure. meet. I'll work with operations or marketing. And it gives everyone an opportunity to meet with people People that are on their little sub team but it doesn't take the time of everyone's other time because otherwise we'd be in meetings all day trying to get every single thing covered with every member of the team. So in the media uh, recently there's been a discussion and a debate of not allowing the people to work remotely. Is that there's something to be said for face-to-face -face communication etc. How does that factor into your planning right now? It, it has to be remote at this point. We have a lot of different team members that have full-time jobs, so they're doing that during the day. A lot of our meetings are 6 to 9 at night. There are conference calls at 7 o'clock at night. And then what we need to do during the business day, we leave our current jobs and go and do that in person. But it, it really has to happen remotely at this point because for a long time we didn't even have the space, so everything was on the phone and, and via email. It's been critical. Now, you said strategically one is going to be an extension of the other, and you're going to use it for cross-marketing purposes. Are people's jobs going to be an extension of of each other the same way that you're going to be the general manager of both? There are a few crossover employees. We've got our marketing director, Boston Duck Tours, is helping with the marketing. Our IT person is helping with IT. But for the most part, we're keeping it very separate. There are, there are some synergies as far as the quality of person that we want and the, the feel of that, of that person. But in the end, I think it will be totally separate employees aside from the upper level management where we really don't have a budget for a full-time marketing director at this point. Prevailing wisdom indicates that whom you raise money from is more important than the funds themselves. Are any of the investors the same? Are you trying to tap into their knowledge base as well? Actually, we do have a lot of overlap on the investors, both within Boston Duck Tours and, and, and on and outside ones. But it really does help because we've learned a lot from them, and they have a level of confidence from their experience with Boston Duck Tours. So it was an easy ask, as easy as an ask can be. I mean, not easy, but we had a proven track record from Boston Duck Tours. So when we approached investors, they said, well, you've done a great job with this investment. I'm willing sure, to take makes, a risk on that Sure, it makes perfect sense. You're watching The Language of Business. I'm Greg Stoller. We're talking with Cindy Brown, who is about to open Boston's first ice bar called Frost in Quincy Market 
later this summer. Uh, even in the planning stages, she is a big supporter of using written business plans. So help us understand where you are in the planning stage vis-a-vis -vis written business plans. Well, the business plan that we started with um, was, was very general. And what we found is a lot of it was concrete and able to transfer to actually opening the business. And other areas we found didn't necessarily have the same translation, whether it was the actual location, the actual size, the number of, of dollars we had to raise. So some of it really was a great place to start. But we found once we get into it, there are a lot more issues that arise that you didn't think of early on or you didn't have the resources to determine. And this is exactly that, what I'd love to uh, discuss a little bit more in depth. What have you done with the existing writ written business plan? Have you revised it in written form? Have you then taken the marketing portion and given it to the marketing people and now they've written a full marketing plan? Help us understand and our viewers to understand how you're proceeding in terms of the strategic planning vis-a-vis -vis the written word. Well, we started with the written piece and actually we used that in our offering memorandum, which really is kind of our new business plan. So we took that and put it into a form that the investors can look at before they decided to put their money in. And at sure. that point, it really has stopped there. We go back to refer at certain areas to say, what were we thinking back then years ago, because it's been years since we started, and, and see what the thought process was then. And then now we kind of change it to what's going on within the actual property and with the actual people that we've hired. So at this point, it ended at the offering memorandum. But again, it's still a really valuable tool that we go back in and check and many times. And how do you process, if you will, in terms of strategy, changes in the competition, exogenous market forces, what's happening in local economy, the statewide economy, et cetera. Does that factor into your calculus at all? It does. And you know, we've, we've played with our numbers of projections of guests based upon what the location was we finally ended up with, what the, the feel is in the tourism industry. And luckily, with Boston Duck Tours experience, we can feed through and say, this is how we're doing in our business. This should translate over. So knowing the industry and being a player in the Boston hospitality industry is really important because I know what conventions are coming up. I know what things are coming on the horizon with tourism marketing and it really gives me more confidence in our product more than anything else and talk to us about what you think is happening in terms of staffing level do you think that your value proposition outside of the location and outside of the wow you know concept is going to be the quality of your employees or the quality of the value proposition to the customer the analog being that boston duck is so unique because each of your duck boat captains has a different personality and they're able to really make the customers feel like they're getting a one-off experience is that going to be the same with frost ice bar it really should be and the interesting thing about tourism is there's no huge skill in, in required. You're selling a ticket, you're welcoming a guest. So we really hire people based upon personality, outgoing, fun, happy people that like to talk to other people. The rest of the stuff we can train. So what we do with both Duck Tours and what we'll do with Frost is look for people that have the personality that will welcome people into their home, their workplace, and give them a great experience that they'll hopefully talk about for years to come. And that's been the experience at Duck Tours, and we hope to, to follow that through with Frost. And focusing still on the planning side of thing, is there anything that's keeping you or your investors or management team up at night about this? Yeah, on any given day, someone's probably up at night. A lot of it is finance. Will we and have enough money? And this is because you're doing business internationally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> will, the, will the money be there? And, and, and what decisions do we need to make that need to get us open the first day versus the, it would be great to have an employee manual day one, but do we really need it? Right. Probably not. That could come three months into it. So what are the factors we need? We need tickets. We need um, capes. We need ice. And we need alcohol. Really, that's kind of it. And staff, obviously. But some of the stuff that we really were stressing about, we realize if it's not there day one, no one's going to know and it's really not going to hurt the product. And are your investors giving you uh, enough leeway to do what you guys need to do in the pre-planning stages? Or are they asking for either written or electronic updates in terms of the sources and uses of cash, how that cash has been used, or where you are in terms of implementing the strategy? Luckily, our investors are very friendly and they have not really asked for much. We talk to them socially more so than written updates. We do written updates every couple of months, but more, more so when you see someone, you tell them what's going on. I think they're completely confident in the product and, and they've been very common for what we need to do throughout the whole process. Excellent. Thank you, Cindy. That was terrific, and we sincerely wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Today's three guests spoke about the pros and cons of using written business plans. In our next broadcast on the language of business, we'll begin going through the business plan section by section, starting with the industry and competitive analysis. We'll discuss the nuts and bolts of the business planning process by featuring guests on different sides of each issue. I'm Greg Stoller, and once again, thank you for watching. If you have a business in need of consulting assistance or are an entrepreneur looking to develop a business plan, we may be able to help. Contact me, Greg Stoller, via email or through Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. I look forward to hearing from you.